Well, good day, everybody. We have with us the legendary one and only S.G. Anon. I don't think you really need to know much more about that. His name uh, speaks for itself. He's been a truther in the Patriot community for several years now, focusing primarily on the geopolitical side of things. And um, as he and I discussed offline, you mostly know that we focus on the financial, but I also understand that both sides correlate and marry quite well, as does he. So we're going to go down an interesting pathway of questions, some of which SG has already addressed on prior shows and some that I'm hoping he hasn't been asked yet, except for today. So with that being said, SG, welcome to the podcast and thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, my friend. It's an honor. Likewise. Okay, so let's start SG and, and dive right into some interesting um, topics, okay? First and foremost, I'm going to ask you a question I'm hoping that no one else has asked you or has not asked you that often, and that would be with respect to the China-Taiwan conflict. As you're probably aware, Taiwan's elections are being held this weekend on the 13th, which stands to have significant impact on the world's geopolitical and eventually economical status as well. Uh, as you know, President Trump and Xi Jinping have long talked about the inevitability of this conflict. It's so my contention that this is a staged event and that it's not going to actually last that long, but it serves a much bigger and vital purpose. So with that in mind, I want to ask you kind of two questions inside of the topic itself, if that's OK. The first being, how long do you think this event will actually last? And when do you anticipate roughly that this might start? Um you know, I appreciate the questions, my friend, and thank you for having me. You know, at the end of the day, I think that the China-Taiwan event has to dovetail with whatever happens with Moscow. Um, China and Russia have been very, very sort of in lockstep, but not so much in lockstep. I, mean, I know that that sounds a bit incongruous, but when we look at the behavior, right, it's, it's very much cooperative at critical uh, arenas and levels of society and rhetoric, but at the same time, it is uh, diversified, and you can tell that uh, both governments, you know, in both situations have their own vested interests, their own selfish motivations that they're moving forward in the world. But with the BRICS alliance and China and Russia being essentially the drivers of a lot of that um, alliance around the planet, any movement that China makes in the Pacific theater is going to affect BRICS in a very, very big way. Uh, BRICS is not a military alliance necessarily, but it is a geopolitical block of cooperation. There's a mutual spirit of, um, we'll just say cautious trust, if we could call it that, or, uh, you know, uh, the pessimistic trust, but but willing to come out to the full, you know, to the fold and, and take a chance with one another, and that exists inside that block at the nation state level. So what China chooses to do in the Pacific is going to have a major, major impact on the alliance that they're now a part of, and that they're helping to bolster. And I think, in a, in many regards, uh, to to pivot the world from a petrodollar status to a more multipolar balance. Now, with Moscow and Russia, we know. Uh, or I shouldn't say we know, but we can expect, I think, an escalation of these hostilities on Kiev relatively quickly uh, in 2024. The winter is always an, a, an ally of the Russian military. It's historic. That record's been recorded many, many times. Uh, the Russians are adept at cold weather fighting, perhaps the most adept in the entire world. And so this process has actually led in recent weeks to the encirclement of Avdivka, which is a metro city uh, in uh, central, you know, north central Ukraine. And Avdivka is not that far um, really about a half day's journey uh, from Kiev, the capital. And so we've got the Ukrainian military that has recently published figures stating, um, or excuse me, not the Ukrainian military, we have the Ukrainian prosecutor general who's come out uh, publishing figures stating that the Ukrainian military is losing about a thousand people a day. Um, this attrition rate cannot be sustained. And so we know that a campaign on Kiev is coming if we don't see a surrender event of some kind orchestrated in Ukraine. And I don't believe at this time that we will. I think this is going to be a forced surrender. We're going to go all the way to the last man, the last stand, if you will. So Russia's escalation of that conflict should coincide, I think, if you're looking at the overarching theme uh, with a Chinese campaign. And the Chinese campaign, I don't think, will take very long. Uh, you're talking about an island that's, you know, a few handful of miles uh, in any given direction, your square mileage is relatively low. It does have an extensive underground network and a number of different naval asset bases, both at the surface and below the surface level uh, within that island system. But the, the system itself is, is not nearly as vast and, and, and does not encompass nearly as much territory uh, as the Russian situation and the Ukrainian situation in Eastern Europe. But it does stand to uh, cause, whenever this campaign happens, it stands to cause a tremendous shockwave 
uh, to global, you know, worldwide shipping and energy markets, and and especially those um, financial sectors, because big tech relies on the semiconductors, the microchips, and the nanotechnology that is produced in Taiwan uh, almost exclusively. Right? We have some contractors and some companies that have nearly all of their operations in Taiwan. Nvidia, one of the largest computer chip companies on earth, uh, has a lion's share of their operations in Taiwan. So this affects the big seven, which support the Nasdaq here. Uh, in the United States, right? This affects the cornerstone companies, big tech, Silicon Valley. A major portion of Wall Street is propped up by the wealth that these individual uh, companies have created. And so these companies are going to have an, an intense economic blow when this campaign happens. So we have to time this right because it, it makes more sense to move on this campaign in a significant fashion when the United States military, the black, what black hat component actors remain in that military are is too occupied to effectively handle the escalation, right? And we've seen that uh, in recent weeks with all of the different localized conflicts spawning off. And we see U.S. naval assets here and U.S. naval assets there and U.S. air assets here and U.S. army assets and personnel and equipment, et cetera, being moved there. And eventually you run out of men for the chessboard. And so um, we're moving in that direction, I think, with the Taiwanese uh, campaign. I think it's been very softly and slowly done. I think there's methodical negotiation in the background on how this is going to work. I think you're going to see a subjugation of the Taiwanese government here probably in the next six months. And I believe the campaign will likely coincide with the expansion of hostilities uh, in Ukraine with Russia. Great. Thank you, Eshu. That very well, as usual, articulated. Um, so, yeah, sort of a follow up to that, what you were just talking about. So I think Taiwan is probably more prepared than people realize because they have landmines and things that they're they're expecting the drop to come. They're they're appraised of the situation, as you know, as well. It's not like they're in the dark about things. Um, but what makes me really curious, SG, about this particular uh, event, if you will, is that um, it, its potentiality to free up Vietnam specifically um, politically and also financially with respect to their Vietnamese dong currency. It, I think they can be broken, the, the communism can be broken on, enough off them to free them up to uh, escape, you know, all the subjugation, as you said. So I was just kind of wondering briefly what your thoughts are on that and the impact that that will have for them and maybe other countries as well economically once um, this conflict is resolved fairly quickly. I don't think the effect economically in the region can be overstated. As a matter of fact, I think that's why this process has had to be so um, delicate and extraordinarily sensitive all in this all in this journey that we've been on with this reunification issue. And the same is true. We can say the same is is sort of an overarching true situation of what's going on in Ukraine. But as we saw then, as we saw then, and as we'll see in the, the Pacific theater, conflict eventually will have to come so that different uh, removals of enemy assets can actually occur. Economically, I mean, when when you launch a campaign in the in the Asiatic market block, right, you're going to affect all of the worldwide markets that come out of the basis of that particular market block. The United States economy is heavily, heavily entrenched in the supply chains that come out of Ta or not Taiwan, uh, China. Um, we're also heavily entrenched on the supply chains that come out of Taiwan. But so are the Japanese uh, semiconductor and, and microchip markets, right, heavily impacted by what happens in Taiwan. The South Korean economy is heavily impacted by these Asiatic powers that are dominant economic influences within the region. Uh, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, the same discussion, right? And it's worth noting that the CCP economy is just as debt-based, if not more, than the U.S. economy, but perhaps not as grand of a scale, right? The CCP, excuse me, took um, a loan of, I think it was like $70 trillion or something like that about 10 years ago from the Switzerland-based central, you know, the Davos uh, central bank model around the world. And the, so that loan has been essentially a, a um, the sort of the act of 1871 all over again, right? It's the exact same playbook where you're beholden to the interests of those that have uh, yoked the debt on top of you. And so moving into this military campaign, if you're going to rock these markets, right, you're doing so in a very, very fragile situation. The Japanese economy is not nearly as powerful as it was even just five years ago. The same is true of the CCP economy. The same is true of Taiwan. It's really true of all the Asiatic powers, uh, with the exception perhaps of India being a part of the BRICS nation. And while the Chinese economy or the BRICS block, and while the Chinese economy has improved in the BRICS block, right, we've seen measures taken to um, bulwark and prop up and support that economic beast, that does not necessarily absolve the entire debt-based commerce system. And we've seen that with the uh, bankruptcy of Evergrande and the receivership that has occurred as a result of that, one of the largest developers, land developers in the entire world. So when this campaign begins, 
the shockwave to worldwide financial markets and energy markets cannot be overstated. It will hit the Asiatic region first. I think you'll see a, a severe downturn actually at first of, of economic markets in those arenas and a rise of a revalued situation on the other side of that, much in the same fashion that we've seen the controlled demolition and then the rebuilding from an asset standard of all these different BRICS economies, right? Piece by piece by piece, we've moved away from trading in fiat currency, trading in markets that are easily manipulatable around the world to more exclusively trading in only assets, only something that has a measure which cannot be faulted or, uh, or corrupted or, or manipulated at that, at that nation state level. So I think this process plays out. I think it hits the Asiatic sector first. I think it's just a matter of days. I don't think it'll take weeks. I think it'll be days uh, before we get that particular uh, reverberation here in the North American financial markets and in Western Europe, but those reverberations will come. Uh, the Chinese economy has sort of been the life support system by which the entire debt-based central bank model uh, was yoked onto the world, right? And and that Chinese economy has supported that debt-based model uh, really for the last 10 to 15 years. So we're talking about reshaping that economic beast as well, right? And that's going to lead, I think, to a much more uh, public purge of assets within the CCP. But that's a time for another. That's a discussion for another time. So this event, can't, really, it can't be. Uh, overqualified as pivotal, right? This is going to shift worldwide finance in a massive way. This is coming in the same uh, overarching time frame, right? It's just been a couple of months ago that we saw this event happen in the Middle East, which is threatened to expand significantly. And these events potentially could be occurring at the same time. So you're talking about stressing Suez Canal supply chain route. You're talking about closing potentially the Strait of Hormuz. You're talking about bringing mass unrest uh, and, and unsafety to um, or danger to the Gulf of Aqaba, which is a major, major shipping hub uh, out of the uh, uh, Middle East and into the rest of the world. And then you've got the Indian Ocean, which is going to be affected by these uh, issues, as well as the South Pacific. So there's no way that this conflict occurs in the Pacific theater, and it does not uh, impact Western uh, and, and really worldwide financial and commerce and energy markets in a massive, massive way. Perfectly stated. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I've felt for a while, SG, that the the stage conflict would be, you know, like you said, days, whether that's two or four days is negligible, but uh, it would be a short term event because it's been in the making for so long. Um, I had heard you on a show, I think it was a week or two ago with a, a Christian Patriot uh, podcaster whose name escapes me right now, but I'm sure you'll recall um, the interview. And you had touched on, if I heard you correctly, you had touched on, you felt, uh, she'd asked you about economically that you felt that Nasara. Uh, and its impacts broad reaching and, it, you know, the reset and SAR and everything that, you know, as you said, correlates to that. Uh, you felt that there was, if I heard you right, sort of an, an inevitability that uh, of a time frame with respect to the first and second quarter of this year uh, with financial changes. If that is, in fact, what I heard you say, can you kind of touch on why you said why you feel that that this timing is so pivotal right now? Well, the timing is, is so pivotal, I think, financially for a number of different reasons, right? If we look at the world through the shifting changes in the financial systems and markets, what we can see is a categorical de-dollarization that as of 1 January got put into afterburner. Uh, we have a number of different nations around the planet that are no longer going to trade in the petrodollar, and they bring oil to the table as their primary commodity. Uh, that's a major, major blow to OPEC in the long run. It's certainly going to be a blow to Western markets because OPEC will self-preserve uh, before they will um, go out and allow the Western markets to uh, sort of just take that all of the way to, the, to its knees. But I think it'll eventually get there anyway, to be perfectly frank. We have the alignment of ISO, I think it's 20022 uh, requirements now moving into effect, which, which really establishes a banking and asset-backed standard for banking around the world, uh, notably with international transactions, right? And so if you're going to trade in a system, if you're going to do business in a system, and you're flipping from fiat to non-fiat, you of course need the groundwork, the scaffolding, the infrastructure to make that happen. And uh, those ISO, those new ISO requirements, I think are a component part of that. Um, there's a number of different things that have occurred in the crypto space with massive fines and regulations uh, being drawn out for fraud um, and, and um, you know, massive corruption also being shown at the governmental financial level with what's going on with Bankman Freed and FTX. Uh, sort of like Hillary Clinton in a different flavor, right? We didn't delete the email. She was super careless, but it's not a, it's not a, a, a crime, right? And so it's the same general feel. And they wouldn't be doing these sorts of things publicly unless they absolutely had to. That's the problem. Um, a lot of what's going on here represents loss of control at some level 
of worldwide market direction. You've got these BRICS nations who are disconnecting the African continent, disconnecting the Middle Eastern space, certainly disconnecting um, uh, different components in the Balkans and Southeast Europe. And they've really been trying that for 20 plus years now. And we're starting to see momentum coming to these different continental regions where U.S. hegemony and the, the central bank dollar system is just not on the table anymore. And we don't have um, the focalized controlling, uh, um, we'll just say the focalized controlling interests here in the West who are capable of effecting the type of regime change uh, to, to counter those those rejections of the dollar, like what we saw in 2014 with Gaddafi and, and Hussein Obama, and, and really going back further to 2003 and Saddam Hussein in Iraq, right? People forget that Saddam Hussein would not allow the Western-backed uh, central bank system, the dollar-based bank system, to be uh, utilized in their uh, foreign trade and say what you want about the man. I personally don't think he was a great guy, but he wasn't going to kowtow to Washington, D.C., so they made sure that they were going to remove him. And we don't see that that type of power being uh, displayed here in the world right now. We obviously have a guy who's acting as the resident in chief that doesn't even know where he's at most of the time. So the rest of the world is pushing ahead with the removal of the dollar uh, as a form of entrapment. And the Western interests, I think, are aware of this. Absolutely. Thank you for that, uh, SG. Appreciate it. Funny you should mention um, the resident because uh, <clears throat> about a year and a half ago, a friend of mine graduated from the uh, Naval Academy. I talked about this to another fellow patriot, and uh, I'm sure obviously you're well aware of it, but I just like people to hear sort of your, your take on this. Um, when he received his diploma, after it listed all the credentials, it said Donald J. Trump, Commander in Chief. And as you know, whoever runs the military ostensibly runs the country. So I just would love for you to briefly just touch on that for the people who may not be aware of it or just need a, a reprise of that, that, you know, President Trump truly does have his hands firmly ensconced on the wheel and that all this was a necessary um, set of steps to get us where we need to be. Well, it absolutely is. And this is where the information war gets really deep and dark and murky. And you have to get that broad view, 100,000 foot, you know, message in the message analysis to appreciate what's happening here. I've seen, you know, video and photographic evidence to show retirement uh, commemorations, um, different commendations that have been uh, issued to retiring uh, military service members, uh, um, officer schools, you know, they, like what you just described. I've seen evidence to show that some of them are being signed with Donald J. Trump and some of them are being signed with Joe R. Biden. And so that that speaks to the greater reality, which is that we do have infiltration at command and control within the United States military. And the only way to avoid a civil war is to force these individuals out into the light through a very irregular, unusual set of circumstances that they have never experienced before. And so that's what we've got going on in the world, right? We have a simultaneous mass population awakening excuse me, to this type of organized criminality and this militia style mafia uh, that's occurring in the background, right? It's very militant, it's very aggressive, it's very terroristic. Uh, and a lot of it is made possible by corruption within these interagency departments and these uh, different Pentagon arenas that overlap with the intelligence community, uh, which which serve really as the unelected government of the United States, right? And, and the same is true of, of different Western and NATO nations. So how do you get these individuals to come out? Well, you have an individual in office, right, President Trump, who responded to the COVID-19 bioweapon uh, pandemic with a devolution um, and a, a form of continuity of government here in the United States that placed um, certain component portions of the Constitution as it pertains to military command and authority. It put them into a stasis mode so that we could address the situation. It preserved the continuity of the government here in the United States with the lawful commander in chief. We've seen that through tremendous amounts, just exorbitant and incredible amounts of security for a former a head of state. We've never seen this before. Um, an individual going to court ca court cases and hearings and speaking events with these enormous motorcades with active uh, active duty, uh, you know, EMS units and um, a number of different uh, police and military law enforcement sort of overlaps, right, where you've got National Guard in a certain area partnering with local law enforcement to make these events secure. Um, so all of these are tell-alls, right? These are tell-alls to a broader conflict. But at the same time, we have Kim trailing over top of my house that drew a gun sight over top of the community that I lived not that long ago. So this reminds us then that there are components 
excuse me, at these high levels of government, these high levels of military um, strategy and movement that are sort of vying for ultimate control over one another. Because for the first time, we have a game board that has been flipped on its head to such a point that the enemy does not understand how to put this genie back in the bottle, right? And at the same time that's occurring, we have we the people around the rest of the planet who are simultaneously realizing that this is all a giant farce and that these same dozen or so transnational organizations in cooperation with military intelligence communities around the world have essentially controlled and usurped our governments for decades at this point. It's the worst nightmare scenario for the ones that are in that negative place that are attempting to act against we the people because you have pressure that's kinetic on one field. You have pressure that's financial and business related, right? Intangible pressure, uh, interdimensional warfare pressure coming from the other field. And then at the, at the end of the day, the curtain, which is keeping everybody safe is slowly going up and people are beginning to realize that there's actors behind the scenes that are pulling the strings. Indeed, indeed. Well said, as usual. Um, FG, kind of dialing back to the genesis of our conversation we started a few minutes ago, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the BRICS and break that down a little bit more. <clears throat> uh, a lot of people feel that Saudi Arabia is an important component to BRICS, and, and of course they are. But um, in studying this for a while, my belief is that Iran is really one of the most important countries to join, primarily because of the influence that they're going to have. You talked earlier about the Red Sea, the Strait of Hormuz, uh, and what that's going to do to oil prices to spike them artificially for this short window of time as part of, as you said, the transition. But I'm also really looking primarily at uh, Iran's uh, involvement in the BRICS, because I think what they're doing is they're using the BRICS as a shelter or a place of refuge, because what I see happening, and not just myself, but other people in the community see uh, Israel making the grave mistake where they're going to attack the secret nuclear uh, power plants that Iran is hosting. And also, as you know, Iran is usurping their power over their little brother, Iraq, with the corruption. That's what's been going on in Iraq for so long in Parliament, the fake proxy government, not unlike here in America and many other countries, as you know, throughout the world, England and so forth, um, that are basically just established themselves as self-appointed experts at, against the people for their own sense of hegemony. And now that's being broken up. So it seems to me that Iraq is going to join BRICS primarily as a way of escape once this attack happens, which will help to free up Iraq for the dinar and for their sovereignty. And I'm just wondering, I'd like to kind of hear your musings on that. You know, my musings, I think, are going to be primarily in agreement because research is usually based on pattern recognition, right? We we know the playbooks don't really vary all that much. Different faces, different places, different uh, grammar, right? But the overall, so it's the same script. And so we see with the situation in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia is already in the BRICS alliance. Turkey is very, very interested and, in fact, has worked very closely with Saudi Arabia the last six months to bring their treasury levels to such a point that they can qualify for admission, right? Saudi Arabia loaned Turkey, I think it was $6 billion in solid gold. Uh, last year so that they could bring their treasury to a point where they would qualify for admission at an economic security stronghold basis, right? You can't just join BRICS if you're an ultra weak nation. You have to bring a resource, a value, something that brings you know, value to the block, something that brings furtherance to the agenda of the block and adds real meat uh, to the overall uh, offering. And so Iraq br stands to bring oil, obviously, antiquity, very, very ancient history. Um, I think a great deal of written record uh, Iraq stands to bring to the table. But they also stand to bring to the table a very, very important intersection uh, in the Middle East, which is that Tigris and Euphrates rivers, right? And the commerce that occurs up and down these rivers. Um, and it's very, very, it's, it's, it's an ancient area also. So there's an important component that ties back to that. You're talking about the cradle of civilization. You can take some of the areas in the Iraqi countryside back several thousand years. Um, so they have a lot that they offer, right? Iran has, has a deep state within Tehran, just as they have um, a you know Iranian patriots, and in the same fashion that we have a deep state here at home that is comprising a mass majority of the activity of our, of our bureaucracy, the same is true in Iran, but perhaps even more extreme. Right, the the uh, measures that have been enacted in place under the theocratic style of government, once that was captured by this worldwide hydra, they were very effective at squashing any and all resistance. That's one of the reasons we have seen Iran as a state sponsor of terrorism. We have seen Iran heavily involved and terroristic attacks that did not do we the people on any side uh, really any good except to accelerate conflict and drive prices and worldwide economic pressure that much higher. So Iran coming into the BRICS nations, I think it stands to 
uh, provide a fatal error on behalf of our enemy, right? They're going to, I think, try and hide there, um, just like just like um, um, uh, South Africa. They're going to try and hide there as a as a means of avoiding, you know, overall ultimate culpability. But what happens is you end up bringing the rest of the nations within that block all of their attention, all of their resources, all of their support. Uh, to bear on what you're doing. And if Iran ends up with an active conflict with the United States of America, then the rest of the BRICS nations are going to demand to know why. And they're going to want to know if they're obligated under any under any sort of uh, agreement within that block to meet that military conflict, right? Um, so this is a very, it's a powder keg situation that has to be handled very delicately. We have to remember that it was the Iranian Revolutionary Guard that was sanctioned in October of 2020 for violations of EO 13848 about a month prior to the election. The, the same Revolutionary Guard uh, apparatus out of Iran is heavily involved in the design of software systems that go into, that eventually make their way into election platforms like the DVS platforms that we've seen on display here in the United States for, an, for a number of years now, public attention sort of having been called to this group. Um, you know, Iran, Iranian cyber warfare capability ties into this also. You know, there's a number of different components uh, that lead to this both being a good and a bad thing. I, I think that in, in the initial run if they attempt to get Iran into the BRICS alliance, what's going to occur is you're going to have acceptance based on what Iran can bring to the table. It will further de-dollarize the world, but you also force the Iranian deep state component into an untenable situation by doing so, because now they're opened up to accountability outside of the West with nations that have a vested interest in understanding what's going on with Iran. And the Iranian people are going to, I think, um, support that and encourage that en masse in a very, very big way. So you're talking about the death, really, of the theocratic political class at the end of the day. Absolutely. Yeah, it has such broad reaching implications, like you said, and, I, and as many do, I love your articulation of how you encapsulate everything so that it's um, broad reaching, but also digestible for people to kind of comprehend on a, on a grassroots level. Um, you had mentioned, or it had been asked, I should say, to you, um, of that interview I was referring to before, and I thought it was a, a good point I wanted you to kind of, for our listeners to hear, um, Somebody had asked you about, uh, you know, President Trump, you know, saying very def definitively on September 25th, in less than five months, Biden would be removed and uh, that everything would change on a, on a wide scale level. Um, so with that in mind, do you believe this to be the case? And if so, why? Um, you know, as of right now, what is that? So October, November, December. So we're about three months into that prediction. We're looking at about the end of February, 1st of March for this. Okay. The timing, I think, is absolutely fascinating when you consider that the Trump trials happen at the 1st of March, right? I think they begin on, some of them begin on March the 4th, um, and they're slated, I think, another set of trials to begin in May, somewhere around Memorial Day. It's very possible, as a matter of fact, I think it's plausible, that we see the Democrats dump Biden before this is all over. I think they'll be 25th, I think he'll, he may fall prey to the 25th Amendment. Um, impeachment is a possibility, but impeachment implies legitimacy. And there's a constitutional hang up with that that I just can't seem to get around in my research, which, you know, if you're going to impeach an elected position, you have to acknowledge that that elected position is there lawfully because they're acting in an unlawful manner. So it's the diversion. Uh, it's the it's the, di you know, the, the, the diverting away from their lawfulness that provides the basis for the impeachment. If they're unlawful by design, it doesn't make much sense to impeach, but it does make sense to leverage the constitutional process that is available elsewhere to remove that position. And the 25th Amendment is one of those options. Um, I think it's extremely possible. We have a, a situation here with this resident actor, and we've seen two or three different iterations of the same actor um, that are continually pointing us at a worsening of health, a worsening of narrative, a worsening of cognition. Um, everything about the guy is declining and failing, and it's on purpose. We're destroying not only his legacy, but also uh, his impression in the minds and hearts of we the people everywhere, right? And so this process, I think, ends in a shameful removal of some kind. Perhaps he's forced to resign the presidency, um, just as Nixon in 1973, right? That would be poetic justice. Nixon was a complicated individual, right? He's not a clean, it's not a squeaky clean man by any regard, but he was forced out of the presidency by the intelligence community um, at, at the threat of a potential nuclear uh, event happening. And so that resignation was us being coerced with our elbow behind our back against the wall. This could be very well, I think, a, a moment of symbolic justice prior to March, right? It's, the, Biden has a very late scheduled State of the Union, from what I understand, going all the way to March 7th or 8th. 
um, which is one of the latest on record, I think one of the latest in the last hundred years. And so could that be because we're setting the narrative for perhaps he's not going to be giving the State of the Union? Uh, perhaps that's going to be from someone else within the administration, ostensibly with the vice president uh, select, which would be the, the um, Jamaican, half Jamaican, half American Kamala Harris. Uh, who's not actually qualified to hold the office and who's even m less popular at this point than Biden is amongst the demographics that uh, still pay homage to those mainstream media outlets. So, you know, President Trump does not often say things that don't come true in some form or fashion, especially not the ones that get repeated uh, more than once. And while he hasn't repeated the five month time frame, to my knowledge, he has said a number of times, including on Tucker Carlson, with one of the largest audiences in the world, that it's extremely unlikely Biden makes it to the gate. I think we're being prepped for that removal and potentially original and unprecedented events here in the United States uh, to kick off um, very, very soon. Yeah, I'm with you. Absolutely. And yeah, I believe it was September 25th. So that would roughly put it around the, like you said, late February uh, time frame. I'm sort of, and I'm, I'm not exclusive in this, obviously, but there's there's others in the know who feel that what's going to happen is the, the House is going to push for impeachment, but that'll just bring pressure to bear of the inevitable inevitability of him stepping down, probably most likely whoever that is, to a undisclosed medical illness to try to save face for the Democrats in the deep state. But it will just reveal all of the flaws and frivolities of that party and the deep state for, for many, many years. So yeah, I'm sort of anticipating uh, a late February uh, resignation due to, like I said, undisclosed medical illness. Like like you said, it'll set the stage and, and leaves them extre extremely vulnerable, which is is by design. Um, pivoting a little bit to your point about President Trump, uh, there's an interesting article that came out today. I don't know if you saw it, Matt Wallace on X. He was reporting um, there's some type of an assassination attempt that they're going to try to use on uh, President Trump. And I, I know it's been discussed before, but I would just love for the audience to kind of hear, you know, your perspective and, and sort of facts on that, that uh, potentiality. You know, I think my opinion on that particular issue is still out to jury, quite frankly, we're still out of deliberations, but I would not, excuse me, put anything optically past this movement that we're experiencing here in the United States. Um, pardon me. So this, the idea of assassination on President Trump, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? We've moved to the legal lawfare. We've moved to the um, the uh, obstruction and interference of the electoral process. If we're going to move that needle any further, in the sense of a third world, um, you know, Manchurian corrupt government, and the actions that that same government would then take, that regime would then take to solidify its power, assassination and removal of political opponents by force is about the only card that we have left. Um, how this plays out is, I think, anybody's game. I would not put it past. Um, the narrative space optically, I certainly would not put it past bad actors that remain, uh, you know, here in the in the world in this period of time who are still as yet to select which side of history they're going to fall, you know, on in the long run. Um, that being said, I also believe that that's a major reason we have such intense security, not just around President Trump, but around everywhere that he goes, and even in the airspace, uh, you know, over Mar-a-Lago at any given point in time. We've tracked three FAA closures over the Fort Lauderdale area just in the last 15 months. Well, that includes Mar-a-Lago and all of the airspace over top of that, right? Um, President Trump, I think, would be the, the number one man in the world with a bounty on his head if we were to consider um, the deep state as having any real true power. Um, and remember that they do have some kinetic force left in them, right? This is a fight because we have to have the fight. This is not simply a, a pantomime, although that is certainly part of it, to force con different components of the fight to move forward in a particular fashion. But it's because we need the kinetic assets to come out. We need to see where all the corruption is. We need to see who is being activated at the local, state, and federal level here in the United States of America across all of our different institutions, bureaucracies, agencies, military, et cetera. We need to get a broad view picture of everyone that's for us and everyone that's against us. And that takes time. And we have to ratchet the heat up. We have to ratchet up the pressure in the public space to drive that needle forward. And a, a great way to do that would be a, an attempted assassination. So this this could come, you know, as a narrative preparatory event, it could feasibly come from both sides. It will obviously be blamed on the on the the Democratic side. It will obviously go down on the heads of the deep state bureaucracy, the intelligence community, the DOJ, the FBI, etc. Were it to become a publicly acclaimed uh, uh, attempted fact. Right. But and, and we really were sort of using nebulous hyperbole or excuse me, hypothesis right now because we really don't know. Um, 
but at the end of the day, it could be a special operation as well with intense effect to the narrative space, intense uh, uh, vitriol uh, then cast against the U.S. government as an institution. Uh, certainly, you would activate, you know, the the war spirit. The you know the war. You know, I think there's a, a, a line from a particular movie. Let me see your war face. Right, you would activate that type of response from the MAGA community. Certainly, from conservative, independent, red blooded America, and that could very well prime our society for the necessary transition. I think to a temporary state of military control control at the forefront. We're already there in the background. It's already been happening and it's been happening for 20 plus years. If we look at 923-2001 with Executive Order 13774, George W. Bush put the United States of America into a soft core shadow based uh, military dictatorship. We suspended different components of the Bill of Rights. The Patriot Act after that made much of those suspensions into a legal codex that we could then leverage against we the people. Uh, but leveraging the powers of the wartime powers of the presidency, George W. Bush invalidated a great deal of the U.S. Constitution and placed it into an emergency stasis mode. So this dictatorship scenario that we're talking about, which could very well include an attempted assassination against the leading political opponent, we really don't know. But that dictatorship situation must itself be realized out into the foreground so that we can drop it, so that we can cease national emergency conditions, so that we can return to common law basis and manage our nation as we are supposed to. Absolutely. Absolutely right. So tying it back, SG, with that in mind, with what you just shared, um, with the potentiality of, of uh, and probably I would say, you know, the high degree of probability that the Biden is removed sometime in, you know, mid to late February or ish period of time. Um, would, would the SARA have an impact in terms of, you know, restating uh, the election cycle, because I don't believe that we're going to see a traditional election this year like like normal because of all the obvious touch points connected to it. Could that be the way for the military? Because like you said on your last show with this uh, this uh, truther, you were talking about the military doesn't have to go through red tape. They can just, you know, invoke the war powers and basically um, bring President Trump back in. Do you think that's a uh, high degree of probability, and might that happen within this time frame after the Bidens removed? You know, honestly, I'm not certain. I really don't know about the particular time frame, but I do think that that there's a degree of probability in that scenario that we have to give uh, some attention to and some credence to, because we're entering into unprecedented political waters here in the United States. Right? We've been there for a while, but now they're really starting to turn the the re the rhetoric up. And the symbolism for that matter as well. I mean, Biden gave this recent speech, I think it was January the 5th at Valley Forge. Um, it's it's so in your face at, at this point um, with the symbolism and the references and the different history converging all at once here in the United States of America, that something enormous and original is coming. Um, the, with the specific you know, question about Nassara, I'm not certain that Nassara, Nassara, whatever people want to call it, is going to be referenced by name necessarily in this process. But I think we have hidden the core components of that particular act and what had to occur as a result of that act within the continuity of operations plan. Right. We've seen a transitioning from the financial system old to new. We've seen a seizure of wealth at, at macro enormous levels that almost it almost pales to, to try and quantify and really give out there to the people. You're talking about hundreds hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different plane loads of gold, precious metals, gemstones, antiquities, uh, mosaics, et cetera, going back hundreds of years here in the in the in the world that have been uh, shifted and moved around. Um, you've seen a, a number of Trump's executive orders extended by the Manchurian, which extend certain component national emergencies that are critical for the overall operation, including the executive order authorizing National Guard soldiers. I think it's no more than a million at a time and no more than a 24 month uh, rotational period of service that's been extended multiple times. Um, and so, you know, the core components of that National Economic Security and Reformation Act, which is what Nasera stands for, I think are beginning to flesh themselves out in an espionage way, right? We're being, we're utilizing the, the continuity operation in the United States of America, along with different operations around the rest of the world that are all dovetailing in a special format to shift around the core components of world geopolitical power, business power, legal power, uh, academic influence and power, right? Uh, in accordance with the spirit of that initial document, that National Economic Act that we talked about. So a new election would have to come at some point, right? Or a, or a, 
a symbolic election administered in a way that's never been administered before in the United States, that has to be a part of this process. Uh, the Trump trials are going to show out, for example, that President Trump, I think, should be the, the lawful commander in chief. I think we're going to get to that point where the election fraud presented will be so determinative, so inarguable, so collected by a uh, vast government institutions and agencies, massive reports all around the planet, certainly reports from the United States Air Force and Space Force and Cyber Command uh, during these elections, because General Paul Nakasone told us that NSA and that Cyber Command was were watching these elections in 2018, again in 2000. 2020. I have no reason to believe that they wouldn't follow the same pattern in 2022, right? So these, these trials are going to present out categorical definitive evidence to show that the election of 2020 was uh, was attacked and was uh, usurped, and the election of 2016 was also attacked. And it was just, uh, I think, a stroke of, of God's grace here in the world that we were able to overcome that particular attack and that people were in the right places at the right time to make sure that we had the right person in office to leverage the U.S. executive. So when this comes out, and it's supposed to be live streamed to YouTube, which has a worldwide reach, when this comes out, we're going to learn that the NATO nations have been stealing elections from one another vis-a-vis -vis their intelligence communities, right? We're going to learn that we're not really all allies. We've, built, we've been attacking one another in the background, and even a lot of our elected representatives have had no idea that these events have been going on. And they drive context that is so important to the international discourse. It's so important to understand who we are in the world. So after that comes out publicly in a big way, what then is the response from the United States Department of Defense? We now have a categorical situation presented potentially on the heels of Biden resigning and, and just um, heading off into the, the annals of history, ostensibly to avoid the, the uh, evidence that's coming out with these Trump trials. But that's, that's going to show um, that we've got a, a, the wrong commander in chief potentially. And that is a constitutional and, uh, and nationwide, countrywide crisis that even your most gaslit, blue-haired liberal would have a very, very hair on their neck standing up reaction to. You mean the wrong person is in charge of the military forces of the United States? Whether you like those forces and support them, whether you dislike those forces and disagree with their mission and existence in the world, the fact that they do have such influence and power, that there is such a world, uh, a world structure that may be under the wrong hands at play, that is very disconcerting for everyone, regardless of political ideology. So, you know, this entire process I think could very well lead to a questioning, a pausing of our society, likely coinciding with deep state desperation crises that they attempt to foment and create in this process, where we where we put the nation into stasis publicly and we say, okay, we need to figure out what has occurred here. And if we have the wrong commander in chief, we need to read the right one into the position publicly. We need to have an interim government representing the civilian population with their last lawfully elected representatives. And we need to get to the bottom of this. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, just a couple of other quick touch points, because I, I know we're almost out of time. I don't respect your time, obviously. Um, these two, I, I, on my Telegram channel, we post a, a lot of different articles of information, not unlike yours, uh, primarily financial, but some geopolitical as well. And I thought this was noteworthy to bring up with you. It's information that came out today I thought was interesting. The two, the two articles themselves don't necessarily directly correlate. But at the same time, as Q said, um, everything is, you know, is connected and it had to be this way and that we, we, would, we would see arrests and resignations. And um, one has happened today and obviously the other uh, have happened behind the scenes, but are now starting to come out in the fold for um, the normies, we'll call them, uh, of society, uh, the, the larger contingency, as it were. Sky News reported today that court documents have alleged sex tapes taken of Prince Andrew uh, Clinton and Sir Richard Branson by Jeffrey Epstein. This we we know on the inside track, but it's interesting now that the a, a mainstream source is is starting to finally acknowledge it. And then Inside Paper today is talking about French Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne is resigning the presidency, and she formally handed a resignation into Macron as part of the resignation. Um, we'll call it initiative. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could kind of touch on those two subjects and how they all kind of tie together in the totality of what we're looking to see. 
Well, you once you appreciate the different hierarchies out there, right? And this is for the audience that may be coming new to this discussion. Once you appreciate the hierarchies of power as they actually are, in other words, the U.S. president, while a very influential and powerful position, is not the end of the road. It goes above that. You get into the banking class, right? The banking elitist. Then you get into the entrepreneurial transnational globalist class. Uh, then you get into the royals, right, who sort of control those entrepreneurial globalist class. Um, the Epstein operation, and it is an operation, right, sought to gain influence within those classes that supersede governmental levels, nation state boundary lines around the world. So you would be talking about the royals, you would be talking about the globalist transnational corporate uh, billionaire club, and then of course you would be talking about the banksters that sort of serve alongside and in some cases sort of below them. It's a nebulous blend, but they make it work. So these individuals would be your targets with any sort of blackmail operation, regardless of what the basis of that operation is, because these individuals are necessary to control the presidents of countries, the prime ministers of countries, the different elected officials, the academicians, the clinicians, you know, all of the different people around the planet that are influential in making the machinations of society turn at the public level, where the public the mass population interacts with community, commerce, society, et cetera, and they live out their lives. The rest of the of the group at the very top, um, in a perfect world for their for them, and it has been for a very long time, is able to hide in the background and leverage any sort of agenda, any sort of push, any sort of change of mentality and thought that they wish out onto the world with very little um, blockade because you have a staggering, a, a cascading level of blackmail that comes from the top down. Right, it starts with the capture of the top, and then all of those individuals and components assist. The beast and capturing the rest of the operation. It's a mutually inclusive, self-sufficient, self-serving um, uh, locus of control, and we the people aren't invited. So Jeffrey Epstein is indicative of one of these very highly, very excuse me, very high level blackmail operations that ran across all different arenas of society, ran across prime ministerships, ran across presidencies, ran across academic uh, schools of thought, presidencies of universities, right? Ran across the scientific field, involved Bill Gates, as we know, and Bill Gates evidently had a quite a close relationship with Epstein. Bill Gates, of course, being heavily involved with Klaus Schwab. So it's ignorant to think that Klaus Schwab and his agenda at the WEF would not also be connected to Epstein and the various operations being run by that blackmail group. So you have the release of these documents coinciding with a couple of very interesting moves at the international level power wise. You have the resignation of the French prime minister announced in the early hours this morning. And then about a week and a half ago or so, you had Queen Margaret II of Denmark decide on live television that she was going to announce that she was abdicating the throne. It's the first time that a queen from Denmark, a Denmark royal, has abdicated in more than 800 years. Um, and this evidently came with no warning, uh, no prior preparation for the family. Everyone found out at the same time that Margaret had made this decision. So one has to ask, what is occurring in the background? What is occurring in the information space? What is occurring in the narrative and the minds and hearts of we the people that that is um, presenting such a a concerning situation that you have royals and governmental ministers and different level um, uh, institutional employees and and business and you know business executives and things like that that are resigning or turning over um, excuse me running of their various organizations um, such as Soros and and his son Alex Soros right turning over the running of their organizations uh, to other individuals. I personally think that you could make the case. I don't think it's that much of a logical leap um, to think that these individuals may uh, not be cast in a, a favorable light as it pertains to certain individuals around the planet who are being very highly exposed in a very public and embarrassing way. And they may be looking to um, uh, get the heck out of Dodge, if you will, before the, the pitchforks be, you know, come to the come to the um, governmental palace. So, you know, and now again, this is this is speculation, but it's drawn from very fascinating correlations relative to the the preparation of what's occurring in the the narrative and psychological warfare space. And we know that this espionage conflict around the world is primarily centered there because what the people believe and know will determine what the people will press press for and what type of pressure and push we can really put against the deep state. And when we get an executive back into the position of the United States presidency who is not beholden to these interests, uh, like Donald Trump, for example. At that point, if we the people are on a consciousness alignment level, there is no hope for this for this group of individuals. So this is existential for them. And you may have individuals deciding that they're not going to roll the dice. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, sort of this will be the final question comment for USG to kind of serve as a softball for you to 
talk to the audience directly, but one of the many things that I've always appreciated about you over the, uh, the years of this process is your cogency and knowledge of, of vast subject matters and understanding how they correlate. And as I said earlier, the way that you're able to articulate in a way that is broad reaching for a highly intellectual audience, but also at a grassroots level of people who are just on the infancy stages of their, of their uh, growth and journey in, in, um, in the discovery and the awakening movement, if you, if you like. Uh, but you always talk about how God wins and how, um, you know, the Lord and, and his goodness and his graciousness will triumph over the evil. I always kind of liken that to Genesis 50, 20, uh, when Joseph said that, you know, what you meant for harm, God will use for the good of saving of all souls, right? And, and that's when you share your sort of final points in your show, that's where my mind always goes to as a biblical reference point. But um, it can be easy, as you said earlier, with the massive amount of misinformation and disinformation, which Q said was necessary, um, as we're seeing play itself out as the picture is becoming more and more clear to a wide contingency of people, whether they're in the know or not, it's, it's becoming impossible to ignore at this point. And so with that in mind, um, I would just like to kind of give you the last word to our audience and kind of summarize uh, for those who are in a bit of confusion or are or, or sort of impatient because they've been in this for a while and they're waiting for the final curtain to come down and they need that sense of indication and surety for themselves, for their family, whatever the case may be. Kind of just if you could touch base on your final closing remarks to why people can have a sense of confidence that God does win and that um, goodness will triumph over evil, as it always has done historically, to give them this level of uh, encouragement and calmness uh, in, in, this, uh, in this year that will be invariably a powder keg of information. I'll, I'll leave the last words for you. Well, you know, I think at the end of the day, we have to look at this awakening process as a personal relationship building moment between every walking uh, man, woman and child out there in the world and the almighty. And that's very, very special. And that's very intimate. And it's very, very important for the overall spiritual identity of mankind. And it's occurring at the same time around the world that we're learning. We have spiritual sensory systems and capabilities present within our anatomy that these individuals at the very top have waged. Um, really what amounts to war. They've waged a war on those capabilities and sensitivities, and they have spent wealth incalculable and hours that are simply innumerable to hide the truth of who we really are from us. We are powerful, powerful beings. Uh, we're made in the image and likeness of the creator. Um, and, and we were brought, I think, back into agreement with that, that broad spirit that creates all things, the Holy Spirit that I call of all things, through that empowerment of Christ, right? And, that, and that's what the Christ the Christian purpose here in the world is to come through that forgiveness and through that empowerment to connect to a, a spirit of, of influence and design and inspiration that brought the worlds into existence and brought uh, our wonderful earth to bear. And so when you appreciate that, you then appreciate the gravity of what has to occur here and why it had to be this way. We had to avoid mass die-off events to the greatest extent possible, understanding that there were going to be a couple that were not avoidable. And that's an unfortunate and hard truth here in the annals of history as we look at what has occurred to mankind in the last several thousand years. We arrived at a precipice point where they were going to murder almost nine in 10 of us, right? They were going to take out 90% of the population of the entire planet um, and transmit the, or transmute the rest of the, the population, whoever happened to live through that, through that hell process, into a mind-controlled digital slave. And we were at a point where we were encircled with very little, if any, way out. So we have arrived here and been given, I think, a gracious uh, second chance, a prodigal, a prodigal moment, if there ever was one, for mankind to realize who we really are and what is really at stake in the world and why uh, such evil has that has managed to you know concentrate itself at the very top. Why they did the things they did to hide our identity from us. And can you imagine how quickly the world is going to shift and how rapidly we're going to see a conclusion of this criminality when the entire population of each and every nation state around the world is acutely aware of the main core components of what have occurred here, right? The child sex trafficking and the rampant sexual deviancy that functions as the blackmail currency for the governments of the entire planet. The, the debt enslavement system that has allowed incredible amounts of bureaucratic and commercialized control to be leveraged over and above our societies 
um, extra constitutional control that we've allowed and consented to because we didn't know that we had a choice. We had no idea that we could you know, remove ourselves from that system, not consent to that sort of governance, and there was no true recourse they could bring to us if we did it in a mass population way, right? Um, and you know the different bioterrorism and the depopulation agenda, these are main core components of awakening that everyone has to arrive at in a spiritual way that is meaningful to them and impactful to them and fosters a relationship with God Almighty that uh, is personal and and um, fulfilling and satisfying and important enough to those individuals that they will tend that garden, right? This is about reshaping who we are as mankind. This is about leaving the world a better place. And so the only way to do that is to move through a process, uh, painful though it may be, where everyone is a- afforded the equal right and the equal opportunity free will to choose in their own time and place as God meets them where they're at and then guides them uh, to where they need to go. We needed to allow enough time for all of that to occur for all of us. And we're entering into what I think are conclusive phases um, for this particular stretch, right? We're not we're not out of the war just because Trump comes back to office and we move into a new um, a new style of, of governance here in the United States. That's That's just the beginning of yet another phase of removing this evil from the world, right? We're going to see I think hard and fast removals in this process, but we the people will still have a job to do, even as we go beyond that, you know, perhaps for a number of years as we write the record, as we correct mankind's history books, as we understand who we really are, and as we iron out true cooperative, uh, inspired and fair agreements with one another at that international level, which is a very, very sweet thing that we all want so dearly. So for those out there who are exhausted, I get it. Um, this has been a 13-year process on my end. I truly understand the the fatigue and the exhaustion and just the soul splitting, um, um, you know, tiredness that comes with having to work your way through a dis and misinformation espionage war. But the results on the other side of this that we stand to gain are such that any process that preserves the identity of mankind, that preserves our integrity to the greatest extent possible and helps to purify us to make this world a better place on the other side is worth it to me. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, we had a little technical glitch there. Um, Yeah, beautifully stated as always. Um, SG, thank you so much for your time. We're honored to have you here on the podcast and uh, Always a pleasure to to listen to you on the other side of the mic. And now being on this side is uh, is mutually enjoyable. We would love to have you again uh, in the near future if you join us. And and thanks for being here today. I'm honored, my friend. I appreciate it. God bless. Likewise. Stay safe. God bless.